Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment and will join us a little later in the hour. Right now on Morning News Now, do not come. Vice President Kamala Harris did not mince words yesterday in Guatemala, speaking straight to Central Americans thinking of migrating to America. Do not come. Do not come. We're live in Mexico City for day two of the vice president's immigration tour. Digging deeper this morning, we're learning more about the insurrection on Capitol Hill and the security and intelligence failures leading up to it. We'll brief you on a new bipartisan Senate report. Reducing your risk, the CDC is out with a new vaccine study this morning. It shows the shots reduce the risk of COVID infection by 91% for fully vaccinated people. I'll tell you about the agency's other promising new findings. And from Zoom to Fenway, seniors from over a dozen high schools in Boston will finally receive their diplomas, not virtually, but in person at one of America's most iconic ballparks. Savannah will take you inside the stands for this once in a lifetime ceremony. We begin this morning with the vice president's trip to Mexico, the final leg of her first foreign trip in office. Vice President Kamala Harris arrived in Mexico City late last night after spending the day in Guatemala. It's all part of a tour to address the migration issue at the U.S. border. Before leaving for Mexico, Vice President Harris met with Guatemala's president and his delegation. She delivered a stern warning to Central Americans who are still considering a trip to the U.S.-Mexico border. I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. The United States will continue to enforce our laws and secure our border. There are legal methods by which migration can and should occur. But we, as one of our priorities, will discourage illegal migration. I want to bring in NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. She is in Mexico City tracking the vice president's visit. So, Monica, the VP made her message clear in Guatemala. But Mexico, Mexico, of course, also plays a critical role here when it comes to stopping the migrant surge. So what are the vice president's goals for this last part of her tour? You're absolutely right, Joe. That was a stern warning, one the administration has delivered for months, but clearly it hasn't worked so far, given the numbers and the surge we continue to see of migrants to the U.S.-Mexico border. So that's why the vice president decided to make Guatemala and Mexico her first trip overseas in this role, to come deliver that idea and convey that in person. They feel that may be received a little bit better, but it's all a part of this strategy to try to address the root causes of migration the violence, the poverty, the climate change, what we've seen from the devastating hurricanes. That was the focus yesterday in Guatemala. Today in Mexico City, where the vice president is waking up, she'll be meeting with the president here, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, and they're going to be talking about the important relationship between the United States and Mexico, of course, but also what the two countries can do together, they feel, to help the Northern Triangle, to help those countries in Central America, to dissuade people from leaving their homes and making the treacherous journey, which, of course, goes through Mexico. But as we know, the numbers do tell this story of really record numbers of people still coming. So it's a very tall order that they have ahead of them here today. Monica, this visit comes at a time of some political turmoil in Mexico. Their midterm elections just two days ago delivered a bit of a shakeup. So explain what's going on there and how that might impact the VP's meeting with Mexico's president later today. Exactly. In fact, the square behind me, this iconic plaza, El Zócalo, as it's known, is normally crowded with people. Of course, it's a bit early in the morning here right now, but it's closed down as a security measure because of those midterm elections and because the vice president will be coming here later today to meet with AMLO, as he's known. He is the president and his party did lose a significant number of seats in the midterm elections, even though they still have a slim majority. So his political fate is a little bit interesting here in terms of 
of what he may be able to do with his own lawmakers here in terms of the U.S.-Mexico relationship. But that's right, the vice president coming at a time where they're in their own political turmoil. And here, really, we have to stress, Joe, the violence and the drug trafficking issues here are so high. And this president in this country has issued a policy of hugs, not bullets, to deal with it. And that has not been received well. And that's one of the main criticisms. And that may be something the vice president raises today, an anti-corruption effort, which is similar to what we saw yesterday in Guatemala. And speaking of criticism, Vice President Harris is facing some criticism for not visiting the U.S.-Mexico border during this trip. How is she responding to that? This is something that Republicans have been raising since the president assigned the vice president this task and homework assignment to essentially be the diplomatic liaison between the United States and the Northern Triangle countries. But many interpreted that because of their own muddled messaging at the start of that rollout that the vice president would be in charge of the border and all things immigration. They've clarified to say that is not actually what her role is. But yesterday, she finally confronted this question quite directly and head on and said that she did didn't believe in making grand gestures, so she didn't commit to a visit to the border. Whether that will happen or not in the coming years and months, that's an open question. But it's one she said she's focused on the causes of the root migration, not actually traveling down there, despite many GOP calls for it. Take a listen to how she responded on this particular point. I came here to be here on the ground to speak with the leader of this nation around what we can do in a way that is significant, is tangible, and has real results. And I will continue to be focused on that kind of work as opposed to grand gestures. Joe, the one other thing at play here, there's a bit of vaccine diplomacy. The U.S. has already pledged more than a million doses of surplus vaccine to Mexico, but the vice president hinting there could be an announcement of even more to come as the U.S. ramps up its global vaccination distribution plan. All right, Monica, lots to cover this morning. Thank you so much. At the U.S.-Mexico border, many families are making an agonizing decision to send their children to the states alone. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is in South Texas with their stories. Joe, good morning. Vice President Harris is facing some criticism for not visiting the U.S.-Mexico border today. As law enforcement officials say, the migrant surge here continues. Tired, hungry, terrified. These are the moments they finally reach U.S. soil. This woman from Guatemala tells us gangs threatened to kill her and rape her young daughters. Whether you call it a crisis or not, it is a nightly ritual. Smugglers bringing rafts full of mostly women and children right to this spot. We've been here before, and overnight it happens every few minutes. We speak with one of the smugglers ourselves. Migrants pay smugglers thousands of dollars to make the grueling journey. Discarded wristbands, a sign of which migrants paid the fee. There are now more than 17,000 unaccompanied children in U.S. government custody. The Texas Department of Public Safety tells us the surge has been nonstop. It's very dangerous. I mean, you can see how hot it is. So the humidity, it's, it's going to continue to increase. Some families taking a drastic step, choosing to separate, sending their children alone over the border because they know the Biden administration will let them stay. We meet these siblings, 12 and 10 years old, hoping to reach relatives in Boston. Hey, I see, I see the little, you got to attack Has it been hard? Just after midnight, we meet Jenny Mejia from Honduras with her two-year-old daughter. Take her to in Texas. We call her relative in Los Angeles and pass her the phone. Mommy, come on. <laughs> this is the first time they've been able to speak in two months. Her family in California is now awaiting word on whether she'll be able to stay here in the U.S. while she applies for asylum. Joe. New this morning, a bipartisan Senate report has been released revealing new details about the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The 93-page report found intelligence failures leading up to the attack and says a lack of security procedures left the Capitol complex vulnerable. 
The report is part of an investigation by two Senate committees. It comes after Congress failed to establish a 9-11 style independent commission to investigate the insurrection, something that most Republicans have opposed. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now. So first of all, Ken, what are some of the biggest security failures that are highlighted by this new report? Good morning, Joe. This report paints a picture of a massive intelligence failure, both on the part of national agencies like the FBI and DHS, and also on the part of the Capitol Police. What's frustrating about it, though, is that um, th because this is these are Senate committees, they have jurisdiction over the Capitol Police, they got a lot of information from the Capitol Police. They got emails, they got message traffic, they interviewed members of that police force, and they paint a devastating portrait of, of dysfunctional intelligence sharing of, of, a, of a force that had information about threats to the Capitol, but didn't pass it on and left line officers hanging out to dry. But the report has a lot of gaps when it comes to the FBI and DHS because those agencies resisted some of the document demands from this, these Senate committees. And this really underscores why the failure of Congress to pass a commission to investigate this really is gonna leave some unanswered questions unless Congress can do a better job of getting this information. Because what the FBI knew about the intelligence, what DHS knew exactly, is missing from this report. That said, there are other interesting aspects to this including um, it goes delves deeply into the question of why there was a three hour delay uh, between the time the National Guard was first requested and the time they arrived. And it was clear that the military was concerned about previous criticism it had gotten over heavy handed tactics regarding Black Lives Matter protests. Um, and they're just some devastating, harrowing quotes from line Capitol Police officers talking about what they experienced in this report. Joe, everybody should read this. Yeah, including one who says, I believe, does anybody have a plan? That's one of the quotes that was heard from an officer during all of this. So what recommendations does the report make to try and prevent anything like this from happening again? So one of the big ones, Joe, is that it recommends that the Capitol Police chief should be able to unilaterally request help from the National Guard which he or she cannot do right now. That's gonna require legislation and um, some of the key members of these committees are gonna sponsor that legislation. It also recommends overhauling the sort of opaque uh, structure of the board that oversees the Capitol Police, which includes the architect of the Capitol and really ham was, was, a, was a problem, hamstrung decision-making and, and sort of um, a quick response to this thing because they were trying to get approval from all different sorts of people, Joe. So those are two of the biggest recommendations. And Ken, as you mentioned, this report, limited in its scope, doesn't really look at the root causes of the insurrection. So is this the end of the road when it comes to in congressional investigations now that the Senate has blocked that effort to create the independent commission? No, it's not the end of the road. Both of these committees promise they will continue to investigate, and there will be other investigations, Joe, because you're absolutely right. This, this this is not the last word on what happened. It doesn't, for example, delve into the role of former President Donald Trump. It doesn't delve into the role of far-right extremist groups, and as I said, many unanswered questions about what intelligence and what threat information the FBI had and what they did with it. So lots of questions still unanswered, lots of investigating still to come, Joe. All right, Ken Delaney and Ken, thanks so much. Now to the pandemic and more proof that the vaccines are working to stop the spread of coronavirus. A new study from the CDC shows the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are reducing the risk of infection by 91 percent. This comes as daily case numbers reach their lowest point since March of last year, with an average of 13,000 Americans testing positive every day. Compare that to the height of the pandemic when nearly 200,000 Americans were infected daily. Let's bring in NBC News health and medical reporter Erica Edwards. So, Erica, first of all, what else did this study tell us about the level of protection among those who are vaccinated? Hey, Joe, good morning. So this was a study of, of nearly 4,000 healthcare workers and other frontline uh, first responders during the pandemic. All of them received one of the mRNA vaccines, either the Pfizer or Moderna. The big headline here was just as you said, both doses led to a protection of about 91% just one of those doses conferred a protection of 81%. And even when there were breakthrough infections among people who had both doses of the vaccine, their illnesses were much less severe. They felt better uh, more quickly. They recovered faster. What's more, they were found to have a little less virus in their system, meaning, Joe, they were less likely to spread that virus to others. 
Erica, let's talk about the COVID restrictions. New York could be days away from lifting the lingering remnants of its COVID rules. But what exactly are they waiting for before they do that? Yeah, Governor Andrew Cuomo said that when New Yorkers reach, when New Yorker adults reach at least seventy uh, percent. Let me start over so we can get this out correctly. He said that when 70 percent of New York adults receive at least one dose of vaccine, he is going to lift nearly all of the COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, We just talked about how important it is and how beneficial it is to have at least one dose. Now, right now, the New York New Yorkers, uh, 68.6 percent of New York adults have had at least one shot. You remember that President Biden set a goal, set the exact same goal for July 4th. Right now, nationwide, we're sitting at about 63.7 percent of adults who've received that first shot. Joe. So many numbers right now. We appreciate you guiding us through them so we understand them. Erica, while I have you, there's one more thing I want to ask you about. Most healthcare workers now have the COVID vaccine. They could get it early on. But now workers at a hospital in Houston, at least some of them are protesting the facility's policy, which requires employees to get the vaccine. That's going to be surprising to a lot of folks. What's happening there? Yeah, that's right. The hospital, Houston Methodist, mandated that its employees get the vaccine by yesterday. Now, most complied. Um, Otherwise, they were going to be Uh, suspended without pay for the next two weeks. But there was a small group of protesters last night who said they're uncomfortable because the FDA has not given full approval to these vaccines. They're still only used under emergency authorization. Uh, Some were concerned about side effects. You know, if if they have a fever for a day or two after they get the shots, they cannot go to work. Overall, vaccine hesitancy has been pretty high among healthcare workers here in this country, even though they were the first to be offered the vaccines back in December. There was a surge that said nearly half of healthcare workers in the U.S. remained unvaccinated by mid-March. Joe. All right. Eric Edwards, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. So, Dr. Patel, let's pick it up right there with that last story. We know healthcare workers were among the first to be eligible for the vaccine. First of all, tell us, for you, why is it so important everyone in healthcare settings get this shot? And are you surprised to see some hesitancy among healthcare workers? Yeah, Joe, good morning. So I think it's incredibly critical, and I actually agree with mandates in healthcare settings for a simple reason. We are doing incredibly high-risk contact and engagement, and usually we want to protect patients from any risk they could get. So it just makes sense that we get vaccinated, even though breakthrough infections are incredibly rare. They're not that rare, and especially for dealing without, you know, gloves or masks because the patients can't wear one if you're trying to intubate them or deliver CPR. You have to be in close contact. You can't socially distance. So I think it's incredibly critical, not just for physicians and nurses, but Joe, we've seen outbreaks in nursing homes with attendants who are uh, just helping kind of sit by people's bedsides and they need to be vaccinated. Every staff, front desk, all the way to the ICU. And I'm not surprised, Joe, because I think they, healthcare workers are human. And I think they're resembling a lot of what you're hearing from other Americans. who are not anti-vaccine. But they're concerned about safety issues. They're worried this was rushed. And I think it's critical to talk through those issues. But at the end of the day, critical settings like healthcare, you as a patient, Joe, want to trust that your provider and make assumptions probably that your care team is vaccinated. And I think people have that right. Yeah, I guess I've assumed that when I've gone to the doctor, too. So let, let's right. talk about the effectiveness or what we know about the vaccine so far. We know that all three authorized vaccines have been effective at reducing the risk of getting the virus. But what about spreading it? For example, situations where fully yeah. vaccinated people might be around kids who aren't eligible yet. Yeah, great question. So, And we're really talking about what we call asymptomatic transmission. We do know in general the risk is much lower Joe, with the vaccine than without is it zero? No. And and there are some estimates that put that risk of a breakthrough infection itself in about like one in 1,500 vaccinated individuals. That's less than a percent, less than 0.1 percent even. So it is incredibly low. And I think in this situation, Joe, there's no one size fits all. If you're a parent, you're vaccinated, you are very safe. I'm very safe to be around my children. However, if you're making decisions about taking kids on planes or doing things where you might get an infection and potentially give it to them, I don't blame parents for wanting to just still 
be incredibly cautious, but the risk is incredibly low. And even when we see those breakthrough infections, Joe, those asymptomatic ones, they don't have enough virus even to colonize or potentially spread to someone else. So we don't think that you could harm children by getting vaccinated and going out and about in society, as you should if you're vaccinated. Dr. Patel, let's talk a little more about vaccine hesitancy. Several states in the South, including the Carolinas and Georgia, only have about half of adults with one vaccine dose right now. We know that vaccinations are slowing down there. What concerns do you have about that? What do you think needs to be done to try to get more people vaccinated? Yeah, I, my biggest concern has to do with not only the safety and health of the unvaccinated individuals, but Joe, what it means for our society. We know that one person getting vaccinated isn't just about that individual, it's about the community and getting to what you and Erica were talking about, like in New York, for example, at reaching 70% to get to closer to herd immunity. If we do not get more people vaccinated, then we are putting ourselves at risk by having a pool of people who could spread the virus and create more variants. So we need to go to those people as individuals, talk through their concerns and show them that they can protect themselves and help us get back to normal faster. All right. Dr. Patel, as always, thank you so much. Appreciate it. The unseasonably hot weather is still sticking around, scorching parts of the country. Millions are under heat advisories as temperatures soar more than 20 degrees above average, smashing records nearly two weeks before the official start of summer. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now from Minneapolis. Shaq, how are you holding up there? Holding up well, Joe. I'll tell you, Minneapolis is a city usually known for those frigid temperatures, now dealing with an extended period of extreme heat. Temperatures are expected to break 90 degrees again today as folks do whatever they can to stay cool. Another round of record-setting temperatures as an oppressive pre-summer heat wave bakes the nation. That heat index up to around 100 degrees today. Sweltering conditions gripping the Northeast, Midwest, and beyond with millions of Americans Monday under heat emergencies. It's gross. It's, it's 95 degrees out. And it's June. It's June, it's gonna get worse. In Minneapolis, temperatures topping 90 degrees. Love going to work on a yeah. day like today. Because of the AC? <laughs> because of the AC. Yeah, yeah. Okay. More than a dozen schools here shifting to distance learning today to help deal with the heat. The heat is good in moderation. This isn't moderation. In Bangor, Maine, most students started the week remotely. Sweaty and muggy. And While in Massachusetts and Connecticut, several districts dismiss class early. These are some of the hardest calls more than the snow calls are for us. But when you add the layer of mask wearing that's still required in our schools, that's a whole nother challenge. At this park in Pennsylvania, families welcome the chance to cool off. This is definitely a big benefit that they turned the water on this summer. While out west, triple digit temperatures and severe droughts are intensifying. This is the driest it's ever been in my life. Unrelenting heat more than a week before summer officially sets in. By the way, here in Minneapolis, there's a big divide over which extreme is preferred. And we also know that in terms of those school, those students who have been sent home to work remotely, they will be working remotely through Thursday and then returning to school on Friday for that all important last day of class. Joe. All right, Shaq. Try and stay cool. Thanks so much. So when will this heat wave end? Let's get a check on your morning news now weather with Bill Karen. Hey, Bill. Good morning, Ed. I'll take the heat over like the negative 50 wind chills any day. That, you know, that's just me. You've weighed in. All right. Um, I've weighed in. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, what's been interesting about this heat wave is that we've seen these incredible temperatures in a lot of the snow cities. We just showed you Minneapolis. But how about yesterday in Caribou, Maine, of all places, it was 92 degrees, which is not easily accomplished just early in the season. They broke their record high by about 7 degrees. Burlington, Vermont was 96 yesterday. Syracuse was 94. And the heat index is what's going to make it feel very uncomfortable today. So this is when we kind of combine the temperature with the humidity to give you the feels-like temperature. And notice Newark already. 84, it feels like, when you step outside. That's the warmest on the map. Boston's right behind. Minneapolis not far behind either. If thunderstorms will cool the region off this afternoon. But until then, heat index will jump up to 95 to 100 today from Boston to Hartford to Newark to Philadelphia. New York City will be just below that. 20 million people under heat advisories. So for today's forecast, 
hot and humid in the Northeast. Then those thunderstorms cool things off. The middle of the country is getting very toasty too. San Antonio up into the mid 90s and then Denver at 92. And then tomorrow, notice that more thunderstorms in the Northeast, but no relief in sight for areas our friends in the Northern Plains. This is shaping up to be a very hot summer in Minneapolis. They're saying this could compare to some of the warmest ever recorded. And 1988 was one of the warmest ever on record. All right. I think I remember that vaguely. <laughs> All right, Bill, thank uh, you so much. That's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Coming up, the feds have recovered millions of dollars paid out in a high profile ransomware attack. We'll he- tell you how they turned the tables on the hackers next. Let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer joins us from Beijing. Janice, good morning. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Uh, Canadian police say that a man accused of killing four members of a Muslim family by running them over with a pickup truck apparently targeted them in an attack motivated by hate. This happened in London, Ontario. This family of five was walking, ranging in age from 9 to 74. Only one of them survived. Police are now considering terrorism charges against the 20-year-old suspect. Here in China, kids as young as age three will soon be able to get COVID vaccines. Sinovac, it's a private biotech company, has received emergency use authorization from China's government to use Coronavac on kids and teenagers, making this the first country to offer COVID vaccines to younger groups. China says that it wants to vaccinate 70% of its population before the end of the year. And finally, in Australia, scientists say that they have discovered a new dinosaur species, and it is a big one. They figured that the Titanosaurus was 21 feet tall and had a tail the length of a basketball court. Now, this skeleton was first discovered on a farm in southwest Queensland. They figure it lived about 92, 96 million years ago, and they now consider it one of the 15 biggest dinosaur species known to the world. Titanosaurus. That's a good name. (laughs) Titanosaurus. It certainly fits the part, apparently. (laughs) Thank you, Janice. Appreciate it. In a controversial move, the FDA has approved a new drug to treat Alzheimer's disease. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk explains why the decision is sparking so much debate. Hope for the roughly 6 million people suffering from Alzheimer's. The FDA approving the first medical treatment for the disease in 18 years. The drug, aducanumab, developed by the company Biogen, attacks the amyloid protein, which builds up in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. The Alzheimer's Association is calling the approval a victory. That's what Phil Guttis is calling it, too. He took part in the clinical trial and has been taking the drug for five years. My head feels clearer, um, definitely. I'm not cured in any way, shape, or form. But I feel like I have more capacity, more mental capacity than I did four years ago. But the FDA's decision is controversial. The drug is going on the market even though the agency says there are uncertainties regarding clinical benefit and is requiring Biogen to do another clinical trial. The benefit of the drug remains uncertain. Phil Guttis' physician worries about possible side effects, including bleeding in the brain. Where does it leave doctors like yourself when it comes to prescribing this for patients. What what will you do? Well, first, I need to read the drug's label and read it very closely. I also, as a researcher, really want to learn about the clinical trial that they're proposing to validate the drug's benefits. Biogen announced aducanumab will cost roughly $56,000 a year, a steep price tag for a drug that still has to prove itself. There's been a big development in the Department of Justice investigation into that crippling cyber attack that led to widespread gas shortages in April. The FBI now says it was able to confiscate 63.7 out of 75 bitcoins that Colonial Pipeline paid the ransomware attacker Darkside. That's roughly 2.3 million of the $4 million ransom. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins us now. So, Leanne, one of Bitcoin's main attractions for crypto traders is how secure it is. That's why ransomware hackers demand payment in crypto. So how was the DOJ able to turn the tables on these hackers? Hey, Joe, it was a big announcement by the Department of Justice yesterday. Well, the FBI, they were actually able to figure out the password 
of the wallet where these bitcoins were being held. And because it was being held in a wallet that was contained in Northern California, the FBI was able to get a seizure warrant and able to crack that code and obtain the Bitcoin. So this was a big win for the Department of Justice in this case, Joe. So did we get any update on where the investigation into the hack stands now? Well, we know that President Biden is going to meet with Vladimir Putin in uh, at, the G- uh, at the G7 next week, and we expect him to bring this up there. That's because Darkseid is a criminal gang that is in Eastern Europe and Russia. And with these hacks and the cyber attacks and the threat of cyber attacks, we know that this is going to be an issue between those two leaders next week. And today, the Colonial Pipeline CEO is actually set to testify before the Senate Homeland Security Committee. What more can you tell us about what we should expect in that? This will be the first time we hear from Joseph Blount, the CEO of of, uh, Colonial Pipeline. And what he's expected to say is talk about the decision he made to pay the the hackers. And that was something that is very controversial. And he told the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago that it was a really tough decision and one of the most difficult decisions he's ever made. But ultimately, it was impacting too many people. He needed to get operations and oil back online. And so he w- reached out to the FBI and he decided to pay the hackers. Joe. All right. We'll see what happens with that later today. Leanne Caldwell, thank you so much. It's graduation day at Fenway Park, and no, it won't be held over Zoom. Coming up, our own Savannah Sellers will join us live outside one of America's most iconic ballparks for an in-person ceremony like no other. Next. One year ago, graduation season, like everything else, went virtual with countless students celebrating their major milestone over Zoom. Now, as vaccination rates rise and COVID cases fall, the class of 2021 is able to celebrate together and in person. And our own Savannah Sellers is outside Fenway Park in Boston this morning, where students from dozens of Boston public high schools will receive their diplomas in the shadow of the green monster. Savannah, tell us how many students are going to be graduating today? What are these ceremonies going to look like? Hi, Joe. First of all, I'm so happy to be with you, even if it's from afar. Good morning. Great show so far. So today we've got two high school graduations going on here, but throughout the next couple weeks, Boston Public Schools will have several graduations here. The first one, we've got 60 graduates. They can bring as many guests as they want. The second one, a little bit later today, 130 graduates. They can each bring 10 guests. So we could see some pretty good-sized crowds here. These graduates are going to enter right here through Gate B. I mean, you can see how neat this is. It's right at Fenway Park, which, by the way is the oldest active MLB park. This has been here since 1912, but this is a new thing that there are actually these graduations going on. They'll be in the stands and so many of them are telling me that they are just so excited that this is how their school year is being capped off, Joe. Yeah, I know you've spoken with some of the students about what this graduation means to them. I can only imagine after seeing last year's graduations, how nervous they were for their own. Tell us more about what they're telling you. Joe, Joe, absolutely. And it's not even just how graduation was last year. It's the fact that so many of them have been virtual this whole year. They had the option at some of these schools today to go back. Some of them didn't take it, though, based on what was going on at home, that type of thing. So they haven't been with their friends. I actually just heard that they didn't see each other. They hadn't seen some of their friends until they went to go pick up their cap and gown for today. They also didn't get a prom. So actually having this graduation just really means something. Here's what Kayla Montanero told me just a little bit ago. it off being at Fenway Park because I feel like then it kind of it makes up a little bit for the fact that we've lost so much throughout the year. Joe, she also told me that getting to graduate here at Fenway makes her feel like a superstar, which I think is exactly what all these graduates are. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. It's better than your high school gymnasium. I can tell you that. So, Savannah, the Red Sox are also <laughs> offering students and families the opportunity to actually get vaccinated while they're there. How will that work and and any perks for getting your vaccine and your diploma at Fenway? (laughs) 
Oh, yes. You know, we've loved talking about those incentives. But first, I just have to say the Red Sox have gone so above and beyond here. It's really, really neat. In the first place, when they heard that so many Boston public schools were looking for adequate outdoor venues for these ceremonies, they thought, hey, we've got one. And that's what made them decide to jump in and allow these students to graduate here, which is just so neat. And so many of them are so excited about it. But then they're going above and beyond and offering vaccines. This was a mass vaccination site at one point. I met this morning a woman who participated in administering vaccines at that time. She's back here today to give it to these graduates, which she says that she just thinks is so neat. But you can come in, you can get a Pfizer shot, your guests can get a Pfizer shot, which is really important, especially as we're trying to push right now teens, younger people getting vaccinated. It's right here. This is all part of that go where people are. This is where students are today graduating. Now, Pfizer, as you know, of course, you need that second dose. So today they will schedule your second dose on a game day, and you're going to get two Red Sox tickets. You can come back, get your second shot, and go to a game. And, of course, you get your diploma, like you said today, Joe. So there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Very smart marketing there by them. Yeah, grad and vax. All right. Samantha, <laughs> good to see you, and we'll see you next hour with more, all right? You too. See you in a little bit. Miss right. you in the studio. Yep. All right, today is primary day in Virginia and New Jersey. It's the only two states to hold gubernatorial elections in the year after a presidential election. Both races are going to be watched closely. Now, in Virginia, Democratic former Governor Terry McAuliffe is well ahead in the polls. Over in New Jersey, the Republican primary is looking like a two-horse race between former Assemblyman Jack Chatterelli and pro-Trump candidate Hirsch Singh. NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray joins us now with more. So, Mark, let's start in Virginia. What should be what we watching out? For? What should we be watching out for today? What should we expect from the vote? Yeah, Joe, as you mentioned, uh, former Governor Terry McAuliffe is the big front runner in this Democratic primary for the right to face uh, against Republican Glenn Youngkin in the fall, which will be a must watch contest by, by the nation and politicos. Uh, and uh, Democratic primary voters in Virginia have this choice. Do you kind of go stay the course, go with the status quo in a person like Terry McAuliffe, or do you go in a new history making direction? And there are three black candidates, two of whom are running to be the state's first uh, African-American female governor, as well as the nation's first African-American female governor, and Jennifer Carroll Foy and Jennifer McClellan. Uh, but the problem that they end up having is that the, that, that the people who might want to vote for McClellan, uh, Jennifer Carroll Foy, or Lieutenant Governor uh, 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 Justin Fairfax might end up dividing the vote, where Terry McCollum's winning percentage just needs to be about uh, 40 percent, 45 percent to be able to take this. But if there is going to be one candidate who does press Terry McAuliffe, it is going to be Jennifer Carroll Foy. What Terry McAuliffe has done is trying to talk about that he ends up having policies. He's been talking about big, bold policies, not too dissimilar to from what we saw from Joe Biden in the Democratic primaries of 2020. Here was Terry McAuliffe yesterday. Take a listen. We can't take around the edges. We need some of those experience that will come in and shake it up. Raising teacher pay, dealing with childhood nutrition issues like we're dealing with here. But if we don't do it and we just want to go along and get along, guess what? We're not going to be able to deal with this COVID crisis. It's going to be with us for many years to come. I'm ready to go big. I'm going to be bold. Yeah, so Joe, as I mentioned, McAuliffe is the front runner. I'm going to be looking for his margin to see if he's able to really put distance between himself and the rest of the field tonight. All right, let's talk about New Jersey. The Republican primary there is looking a little bit closer. This is important. We know New Jersey can elect Republican governors, but what's the latest there? Yeah. And again, this is a race in which you ended up mentioning Chatterelli is the person who seemed to be the prohibitive front runner, but it's very crowded, a high undecided vote. Uh, this is a Republican field where it shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, former President Donald Trump, loyalty to him has been a really big campaign topic. And uh, this contest is all for the right to challenge incumbent Governor uh, Bill Murphy, a Democrat in the fall. All the polling shows that Murphy is the big front runner and that this this race probably won't be as competitive as Virginia will be in the general election come November, Joe. So, Mark, these are both Democratic states, which President Biden won in last year's election. Do Republicans have any chance of winning these in November? And are these states bellwethers at all for what to expect in the midterms, especially when it comes to trying to gauge the popularity of the former President Trump? 
Do Republicans have a chance, especially in Virginia? The answer to that question is yes. Historically, going back to the 1970s, the party that has held the White House, so in this instance, it's the Democrats, uh, have had a really hard time holding on to the Virginia governor's race, where the opposition party is won, with just one exception back in 2013, when Terry McAuliffe ended up uh, winning the governor's mansion in Virginia. And as we've seen, Republican governors, there are Republican governors in places like Maryland, in Massachusetts, it's in Vermont. I think the really tricky question, though, is can Republicans be able to separate themselves from uh, Donald Trump and how much of an issue is Trump in these contests come November? All right. We will see. Mark, thank you so much. Good to see you this morning. Coming up, your chance to own the classic Doge meme as it's auctioned off as a non-fungible token. We'll tell you how you can bid on this piece of Internet history after this. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Contessa Brewer joins us now. Hey, Contessa, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Apple is unveiling a host of new features at its annual developers conference. Among the big ticket items we saw shown off yesterday, iOS 15 with improvements to FaceTime, like links that can help people schedule calls with those who use Android or Windows devices. A share play feature also lets you watch, listen to shows, movies, or songs with others. And Apple Wallet will soon let you store your ID so then you can just, for instance, show your iPhone at airport security where eligible. The heads of major airlines that fly between the U.S. and Great Britain are calling on both countries to lift transatlantic travel restrictions put in place during the pandemic. They say, look, there's sky high vaccination rates. It means that travel can restart safely in the U.S. and U.K. And since last March, the U.S. has barred nearly all non-U.S. citizens who've been in the U.K. within the past 14 days from entering this country. Most U.S. travelers visiting the U.K. have to quarantine for 10 days upon arrival. And Southwest Airlines is automating some job recruiting tools. It typically takes up to 45 days for the company to make an offer after posting a job, but now it's aiming to cut that time in half. It includes software that uses artificial intelligence to tailor job postings and a chat bot that can ask basic screening questions such as work eligibility and comfort with salary. The machines are taking over, Joe. <laughs> they are, <laughs> but at least we're flying again, so we'll have to look at the bright side there. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Contessa. Doge is up for sale. The iconic meme of an excited Shiba Inu dog is being auctioned off as a non-fungible token or NFT or nifty, I believe we've been calling them. The meme is what led to the name of the multi-billion dollar cryptocurrency Dogecoin. Here to explain it all because I don't understand it is NBC News youth and Internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt. So, Callan, for those of us who aren't experts on this, like me, what's going on here? Joe, like you said, Doge is a meme that is from the early 2010s. It depicts that Shiba Inu uh, Kabosu, who is looking excited. There's actually a range of photos. There's like angry Doge, there's happy Doge, there's a whole bunch of Doges. So, um, but that is the original Doge meme. And it is kind of part of this meme gold rush that's happening where a bunch of memes that are kind of from early internet culture, early meme culture are being auctioned off and they're fetching a lot of money. So how much money might this meme fetch at an auction and which other memes could be next to get this star treatment? So we've seen a range in prices. And remember that the cryptocurrency that these sell for is really volatile. So what it may sell for, it may be worth more or later or more or less later on. However, we've seen them fetch between $30,000 to $300,000, $400,000, and even a YouTube video like David After Dentist uh, selling for more than $700,000. So they're fetching a ton of money. And it seems like what may happen is that these classic memes, which are going to be finite, will run out soon. And we're going to start to see new memes that are going to be sold as NFTs. We've seen a TikTok meme, two pretty best friends that recently became an NFT. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that. And remind us, so if you, if you win and you buy this, what can you do with it? What happens next? 
<laughs> well, that's kind of up for debate, right? It, you do sort of own this blockchain that certifies that you own the original, but it's not a copyright. You cannot prevent other people from posting it. And it's kind of like owning a work of art. Like some people want to own a fine work of art and hang it in their home. Other people want to own a meme. And of course, there are prints of art. There are going to be replications of these memes. But a lot of people just want to own the original to have that value, you know, to sort of have the appreciation of that meme or of that piece of art. And so that's kind of what you can do with this meme. Hey, tens of thousands of dollars to own something that's complicated. All right, <laughs> Callan, <laughs> thank you so much for helping us understand this. We appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, cruise lines are setting sail once again in Venice, but some Italians are not necessarily on board with the industry's return. We'll explain next. For the first time since the start of the pandemic, cruise ships are once again sailing through the canals of Venice. It's a welcome return to normal for some, but environmental activists say the ships are causing more harm to an already struggling city. NBC News correspondent Claudio Lavanga spoke to people on both sides of the debate. Cruise liners are back in Venice for the first time since the pandemic, but not everyone is on board with it. These protesters say cruise ships are a threat to the city's fragile ecosystem and architecture and want them out of the lagoon. This is a bit of a David versus Goliath battle. On one side are the protesters who say that Venice was built for small boats like theirs. On the other side is giants of the seas like this cruise liner. Among protesters is Jane Damosto, an environmental scientist who moved to Venice 25 years ago. The main issue for Venice is the environmental damage and the destabilization that they cause to the fabric, the built fabric of Venice. The main issue is also the risks of an accident that unfortunately we know only too well is a real risk. In 2019, a cruise liner rammed into a tourist riverboat and scraped the sidewalk, a near miss that reinforced the protesters' call for a ban. In March this year, the government passed a law that bans cruises from sailing through Venice, but not before an alternative route and berth is found. There is an industrial port on Venice's mainland, but piers will have to be extended and canals dredged. And the new port outside the lagoon will take years and a lot of money to build. In the meantime, cruise liners like the MSC Orchestra will keep coming, like a floating city sailing through another. The news of cruise liners returning to Venice has created shockwaves also far from the lagoon. An impressive list of VIPs recently signed a letter asking for a special law that protects Venice and its historic and artistic heritage. Among their requests, keep cruise ships outside the lagoon, stop over tourism, limit short-term rentals and tourist shops. All those people, they signed the letter because they love Venice. I mean, Venice is one of the most beautiful places in the planet and, uh, and it's an international city. So you have Biennale Art, the Film Festival and many other cultural happenings. Uh, and so it's quite a big, a big surprise for all of them and for us too to see that kind of gigantic surrealistic vision in the center of Venice that is twice bigger than the bell tower of San Marco Square. But not everyone in Venice want the cruise liners to set sail for good. It was the Venice community that asked us to come back. It was the governor of Regione Veneto and the mayor of Venice who insisted, for good reason, the Venice community has been hit very severely by the pandemic. We are happy to be back and to contribute uh, uh, to the prosperity of Venice. Our economic impact, not only in Venice, but throughout the entire Adriatic is incredible. The Port Authority says the cruise business accounts for 3% of the city's GDP and 4,000 jobs depend on it. A divisive issue that cuts Venice in half, just like the canal through which cruise liners, for now, will keep coming. Hey NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here
to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.